Welcome online family, we're glad you're here. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of our content. Also, head over to the App Store and download our TFBC app where you can check out all of our events. You can leave prayer requests for us. You can also follow our sermon notes as we give the message each week. Speaking of messages, we got a great one for you today. So let's dive right in. Um, hey, would you turn your Bibles to uh, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1 is where I'm going to read from as we continue in Proverbs this week, you know, it's been fun going through the book of Proverbs and, and trying to figure out what to teach on. You know, I, I cannot wait. In, in two weeks from now, we're going to be in the Gospel of Mark. If you see in your bulletins, uh, many of you have been reading the Proverbs every single day, J- July 1 through July 31. There's 31 Proverbs and 31 days in July. That's been so cool how that turned out. And I'm getting so much feedback from people who are enjoying being in the Word. That's why one of our classes is going to be how to read your word, because as they're reading it, I'm also hearing, you know, I, Jeremy, some of these verses, I don't, they don't make sense. What do I do with it? And so having Bible study methods will be really good for that, uh, for you, if you'd like to deep dive into that. But then as we get ready for the Gospel of Mark, I want to keep that momentum. I want to keep us in the word on a daily basis. So you'll see uh, just an 11-day um, read through the Gospel of Mark. Mark has 16 chapters, and we're going to spend quite a while going verse by verse. We're going to read every single letter of the Gospel of Mark from August until whenever I can finish in 18 years. Okay, so I would encourage you, though, to as we get ready for Mark in August, would you read the, uh, would you continue in your daily reading and read some of these passages as we continue? Uh, But what's interesting about Proverbs is I can't, you know, it's only four week series or five week series. I can't preach on on every single verse in Proverbs. Proverbs is more of a flyby and it's been fun trying to navigate, okay, what do I teach on? And in Proverbs chapter 28, I'm just keeping Philippians, but in Proverbs 28 verse 1, This one caught my attention the last couple of weeks. And it's just one verse, the first verse of chapter 28. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. And this morning, what I want us to do is to take a deep dive into scripture and present an argument to you why the world needs to see our faith on display. This world, uh, you saw what happened this last week. This world needs Jesus. Uh, someone, one of my friends in this room posted something on Facebook this morning. And, and the, I'm going to butcher it because I don't have it in front of me. But it sense goes like this. It seems like many people think that God has turned his back on the world. Well, no, actually what has happened is we have turned our back on God as a, as a world. And we're seeing the depravity come out. We're seeing really terrible things come out. And what this world needs is Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus came. He came because we're all sinners. He came because we messed everything up. He came because we were wicked. We were born in sin. And Jesus, out of a deep love for the Father, because the Father deeply loves people, Jesus came and died on the cross. Now, Jesus, though, remember I told you last week, he ascended. He is sitting at the right hand of God. It's job well done for him. And now what Jesus has done, he's given Christians a Holy Spirit. And has he told us to be quiet about our faith? No, he's told us to be bold, to preach, to to teach, to evangelize, to live a godly example, to walk in the manner worthy of the gospel. And so this morning I I was reading Well, uh, a few days ago, um, Proverbs 28, that first verse, I'm going to ask all of us in this room to consider our boldness, to consider our faith. You know, as Christians, I think we really are walking advertisements. Uh, A few years ago, and I can't remember what year, what year did I graduate, honey, in Kansas City? Okay, oh, 04, that was high school, okay. Uh, I th- well, Graham was a baby, so I think it was 2016. I graduated from Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and being cheap, some of you guys know me as cheap, or frugal, I should say, uh, I had enough m- miles to get to Denver, but not to get to Kansas City. So I flew to Denver, and thankfully I had a f- we had friends in Denver. My f- previous youth pastor lives in Denver, so we stayed with them, so I didn't have to buy the hotel ticket, and... 
From there, Noel and I, we borrowed one of their cars and we drove from Denver to Kansas City. And in order to drive from Denver to Kansas City, you got to get through this land called Kansas. Raise your hand if you've been to Kansas. Oh my word, Kansas. It's a, love that place, but it's a yawn fest, right? It is just one straight line. One straight line, Noel and I getting through Kansas uh, and we saw this billboard as we were driving to the graduation ceremony. Here it is. The second friendliest yarn store in the universe. You guys, it's in Kansas. So if you want to go, the second friendliest yarn store is not anywhere else but in Kansas. Specifically, Selena, Kansas. So that was 2016, so you know what I did the other day out of curiosity as I'm thinking about the message this morning is I Googled them to see how they're doing. You guys, they closed shop. They're done. Something happened. Apparently they weren't number one, right? They were number two. Should have been number one and they would have continued to go, but they're closed. Noel and I would have never known. Uh, we had such a laugh about that for like an hour. Like we laughed way too much about that. But we would have never known about the second friendliest y- yarn store in the universe if it wasn't for that billboard. Because as Christians, we are walking billboards for Christ. The world needs to see our faith on display. It needs to see our affection and our worship and devotion to Jesus Christ. If the world doesn't see those things, how will they ever know who he is? It is so important that we be as bold as a lion. You know, wisdom, as we've been looking through wisdom the last month, wisdom is great if you have it. It's even better, though, if you share it, right? It's even better if you show other people. You know, wisdom has an evangelistic effect. When the world sees our wisdom, They want to know where it came from, and Jesus' conversations can happen. Or when the world is suffering in foolishness, and they see us being compassionate and benevolent and kind and saying, hey, there's a way out, and we share the gospel with them, that is the secret sauce, I think, to a wise life. Wisdom is not just for us, it's for everyone. But you know, the opposite is also true. Christians, When the world sees our foolishness, when it sees us bickering, when it sees us causing problems, well, you know what the world does? Says, well, no thanks, I don't want that either. They clearly can't answer my questions. So that's why it's so important that we live out our faith, that we say say no to sin, and we, we say no to foolishness, and we aggressively desire to be that walking billboard for Christ. You know, there's a few ways that we can advertise Jesus Christ. One is by our love for one another. That's actually our third point today. I got the points wrong here. Is our love for one another. Another one is walking worthy of the gospel. Another one is our boldness. You know, our faith is meant to be an observable faith. But you know, there are those who don't want us to observe it. Isn't that true too? I know that right now, if, this is a big if, I I don't see this happening today, but right now if a law was struck down this morning saying it's illegal to be a Christian in Tulare County, probably zero of you would would quit proclaiming your love for Christ. I bet all of you would say, nope, I'm going to continue loving him. You know, in fact, some of us even in this room would then be even louder for Christ. We would say, no, we're, we're going to be bold for the gospel. Do you know something like this actually happened in a country? in China. From 1966 to 1976, the Mao Cultural Revolution happened. Mao, he was a communist dictator, and he tried to eliminate the four olds in China. Old things, old ideas, old customs, and old habits, and Christianity slid under one of those, in his opinion. So he shut down churches. He made it illegal to be a Christian. You know what's interesting, between 66 and 76, Christian researchers in the West here in America were like, well, surely the church is going to die there. And they thought for years and years and years as they, we went through the uh, Cold War and the Iron Curtain, they called it the Bamboo Curtain because Vietnam was also a part of that. And they, 
made an assumption that that church must be dead by now because they'd, it had been illegal to be a Christian for so long. And then in 91, when, they, when Christian researchers can go and get data, do you want to know what they discovered? The church exploded in numbers. An underground church formed and many Christians even sharing just excerpts of the Bible because it was illegal to own a Bible. So like one lady would have Philippians, another lady would have Mark, another uh, individual, he would have Exodus and they would all swap and share with each other. They were so adamant about living out their faith even when it was illegal. I want us to, I want to encourage us, we have so much freedom here in California, in Tulare, to share our faith without being fearful of being arrested. What keeps us from doing it? What keeps us from being bold as a lion? Why do we get quiet? Well, I read a book back in Bible college that really helped answer this question. It was, When People Are Big and God Is Small. I think I have it on the screen. It's such a good book. I would encourage you to, to go through it. When People Are Big and God Is Small. And the idea is, you know, God, he becomes little in our worldview, and we, we get so scared of all the big people around us. And so we're not bold for our faith because we, we don't want to hurt people's feelings or because we don't want to look dumb or because we don't want to get into an argument. And so what we do is we, we kind of, you know, systematically put God in the background and we make him a little small and we put people big. Well, one of his lines in this book, Edward Welch says, sometimes we would prefer to die for Jesus than to live for Jesus. It's so true. I think there's so many people in this room right now that would willingly die for their faith. What I want to encourage us this morning is to willingly live out your faith. He gives three reasons why we tend to fear people. Number one, he says, we fear people because they can expose and humiliate us. Number two, we fear people because they can reject, ridicule, or despise us. Or number three, we fear people because they can attack, oppress, or threaten us. These three reasons have one thing in common. They see people as bigger, that is, more powerful and significant than God. And out of the fear that creates in us, we give other people the power and right to tell us what to think, feel, and do. I think that's so true today. Now, it doesn't mean that we always will be bold, right? To be bold as a lion. It says, that's what the, the passage in Proverbs says. It doesn't mean it will always work out that way for us as Christians. We're not always going to experience this boldness and this excitement for Christ. I'm reminded of, uh, and by the way, it says the wicked, the wicked flee when no one pursues. Sometimes the wicked are very bold about what they do. In the Old Testament, you have Elijah and you have King Nebuchadnezzar. They lived in uh, different areas. Uh, there should be two pictures of them. They lived in different areas uh, in the Old Testament, but Elijah was very bold. Prophet Elijah, he stood the test of time. There were times where he was even so bold that he would go and defend Yahweh in front of hundreds and hundreds of Baal prophets. He was so bold for his faith. But then, one time, after suffering in a season, in 1 Kings, he goes and hides in a cave. Now, the opposite is true, too. Then you have King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebu king Nebuchadnezzar is one of those wickedest kings ever in the Old Testament. Do you know, in fact, he even urinated on the temple. That's how terrible he was. He was from Babylon. And yet, he wasn't fleeing. He was... I, I am here and I'm going to do whatever I want. And so we, we see these things happen where sometimes the, the, the righteous are not bolder and sometimes the wicked don't flee. Sometimes they're bolder than us. What I want us to do this morning is I want to ask us this question, will you let people be big in your eyes or will God be big in your eyes? Three questions for us this morning. Does the world know your love for God by your words by your righteousness or by your works and by your love. Would you please stand as I read Philippians chapter 1, 27 through 28. Philippians 1. This is Paul writing to the church in Philippi. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whatever I come or whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that are standing firm in one spirit 
with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that it would be your words this morning and not mine. Lord, I pray that you would help equip us and excite us and encourage us to live out our faith. Help us to be bold for you. You have not given us a spirit of timidity and of fear, but instead you've given us a spirit of fervor. Lord, there are lost people in our community who need to know you. Help us to be godly walking billboards that we would showcase to the world the grace that your son has given us. This grace is not just for us, but it's for everyone else too. So Lord, help us to be bold as a lion to share our faith. Lord, we love you and pray these things in your name. Amen. You guys may be seated. You know, really quick, I'm going to pray one more time because uh, this is our third week in a row where I'm trying to pray for another church in Tulare, and I forgot to do so. So would you please bow your heads, and I'm going to pray for Tulare Bethel Church. Father, I also pray for uh, Pastor Regan and the flock over there at Tulare Bethel. I pray that this morning you would keep them, would you bless them. I pray that they would find themselves growing in your word. And Lord, I pray that they would be united together and that they would honor you in all that they do. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, so number one, does the world know by your words? And one of the ways we advertise our faith is we need to express our faith. We need to share our faith. And in Acts chapter five, so if, or actually Acts chapter four, please turn there. If you brought your Bibles, please turn to Acts chapter four. You know, last week, I asked you a question. If I were to interview your circle of influence, if I were to interview people that you hang out with, go to lunch with, work with, live with, what would they say if I asked them who you were? Or if I asked them if you were a Christian, how would they react to that? Would some in your influence say, oh yeah, because that's all they talk about? Or would some say, what? I've been hanging out with this person for like 20 years. They've not mentioned Jesus once. Where, where would they land in that question? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. You know, uh, this last week we had a board meeting, and one of our board meetings, or one of our board members said this about his, his work this last week. I said, hey, how's work going? This is a typical question you would ask anyone, right? How's, how was work this week? He said, Jeremy, was so exhausting because he has coworkers who are trying to get him to curse. It's like lately, the last couple of months, that's all they want him to do. And... They said, you know, it's 11 o'clock and you still haven't cursed. How come you never curse? Like, we do it. Why can't you do it? Be one of us. And this board member, he's adamant, like, no, this is not good. That's not what the Lord wants for me. God really cares about what I say, cares about my words. But I also want to remind us this morning that, you know, your words is not just the, the absence of cursing or refusing to partake in dirty jokes or, or gossip. It's also about choosing what you do say. So, so being a godly example with your words is not just refraining. That's a part of it, refraining to say things that the world would say. But also, it's being proactive in saying things that we should say. In Acts chapter 4, you have Peter and John. Jesus had just ascended up into heaven, and now you have the 12 disciples, because now they choose Matthias, and so now they have 12 again. And Peter and John were doing ministry together, and they had the gift of healing. They had the Holy Spirit, and they went and healed someone, and then they didn't move on, though. They shared the gospel to this person, and people are livid. Let me read 5 through 21. Listen to this encounter. On the next day, after they just healed someone, oh, by the way, I'm going to read verse 4 really quick. This is so cool. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Imagine the scenario. 5,000 people two days before had no clue who Jesus was. And Peter and John, they do this work. And by the way, the work was always to bring the word. So it wasn't just like, let's just heal a bunch of people and do whatever we want. No, it is, let's, let's use this apostolic gift that God gave them, and then let's use it as an opportunity to share the life-giving message of the gospel. And as Peter and John do that, 5,000 people get saved, and the council is upset. They're livid. 
Check this out. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired. That means they put Peter and John right in the middle. You have this circle of livid leaders. Then Peter and John. By what power or by what name did you do this? Verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. John is, or Peter is bold as a lion. Verse 11, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. By the way, he's, he's quoting from the Old Testament. So much prophecy about who Jesus Christ was. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. And there's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astounded. Yeah, hang out with Jesus. And he will change people's lives like he did Peter and John. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Ah, they're like, oh, these are one of those 12. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, by the way, that's the, the best evidence to bring to this trial. Hey, let me bring the man who had not been walking for years and years and years. So now he's with them. When seeing the man who had healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition, right? Nothing to say back. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot not deny it. They're saying, we can't get rid of this problem because that dude is standing right here. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, oh, the world just loves to try to shut up a Christian. In order that they spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they thought that was a great plan. We'll check this out, verse 18. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Right, that'll solve the problem. Verse 19, but Peter and John, by the way, this is the verse I want for us this morning here in Tulare. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and what we have heard. And when they had threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. Peter and John are saying, hey, listen, Council, you do whatever you want. I cannot help. I, it, it just spews out of me. I've been, we've been with Jesus. We've seen what Jesus has done. We're trying to listen to our Lord. Our Lord has told us to teach. It's the Great Commission. We're to go and make disciples. I cannot talk about anything else but this. And that boldness for Christ is what I want us to latch on to this morning. We've got to use our words. We've got to use our words. There's a uh, St. Francis of Assisi once said, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. It's a good concept. I get it. I, I had this hanging up in my office for a long time. The idea is live out your faith, right? You, you share the gospel by how you, how you live it out. But I would say share it and speak it. You've got to do both. You cannot just do one or the other. If you do one, uh, you know, I'm just going to live it out and I, I'm just going to be really nice and really benevolent. Well, the world has the ability to do that too. There's really, really nice non-Christians. By the way, the opposite is true. Let's say you only, you, let's say you live a worldly life, but then you only share the gospel. Well, that's inappropriate too. That's way out of balance. The world would say, well, I, your fruit is detestable. It's, it's wicked. Why would I ever want to listen to you when you're, you're cheating on your family you're, you're cheating on your taxes or whatever the thing is. God doesn't want that for us. No, he wants us to live it out and speak it out. 
Sometimes the mindset of just simply being a good citizen is not enough. We, we have to use our words. I'm going to read this quickly. In Joshua 24, this is at the end of Joshua. The Israelites have now secured the promised land. This is their land. It's the land that they had even before Egypt. Remember, they left Israel because of a great famine. And Jacob and the, the boys go. Well, Joseph goes first, right? And then Joseph helps save the people. And then Moses brings the people out of Egypt because the Egyptian pharaoh was being terrible to the Israelites. They finally make it to the land of Canaan. And check this out, at the very end, that all, the land is now theirs, secured, and now they're going to go out and live. And he's dispersing the land. And Joshua gives them a big warning. Check this out, verse 18 of Joshua 24. If it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So what is Joshua saying? You need to choose. My wife has a good saying. It's, it's, she didn't invent it. Everyone else says this too. But make your choice and love your choice. That's what Joshua is doing. He's saying, I'm choosing God. You choose wherever you want. And they, check this out. Look what they say. Then the people said, or answered, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord, our God, who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did this great sign in our sight and preserved us all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove us out before the people, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we will serve the Lord, for he is our God. So they make this verbal declaration and say, yes, I will serve Yahweh. But Joshua knew this about them. What was hanging out in their tents was all these false gods along the way. You see, they had synchronized their, their faith and said, yeah, I will serve Yahweh, but I, when I conquer the Amorites, I'll take their sun god because their god will give me, you know, they'll make my harvest plentiful. And then we'll go conquer the people of Ai and we'll take this because this will help us out too. They were adding all this stuff and what they're really doing is offending Yahweh, saying, Yahweh, you're not big enough. We need help. And so they're like, yeah, we'll serve Yahweh, but we'll keep all this stuff. You know, we're not gonna tell Joshua. Check out, Joshua knows this, verse 22. Then Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. So Joshua's saying, be careful what you're saying because you're making, the, it, it's like I do this in, in marriage counseling when a husband and a wife are considering like cheating on each other. Like you remember those vows you made in front of God. When you said, I do, right? When you made those vows, you made them in front of God. That's what Joshua is doing here. He's saying, and they're saying, and we are witnesses. Verse 23, he said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, that's what Joshua, he's being a good leader here. Okay, great, serve Yahweh, put the stuff away, throw it away. The Lord, and the, the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God, we will serve and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. And I will let you read the next book, which is the book of Judges, and see if they followed through or not. Spoiler alert, they didn't. Spoiler alert, it's because we all need Jesus and even they did. That's the Old Testament is a, the Old Testament is a whole section of 39 books crying out for help. We need Jesus. And when you give your life to Jesus, when you say, I'm all in, I love God with your words, then make sure number two happens as well. And that is, does the world know by your works? You have to not just talk the talk, you have to walk the walk. It is not acceptable to just say, well, I love God, and then do whatever you want the rest of the week. God wants, he's looking for total disciples. He's looking for actual commitment. In James chapter 2, verse 14 through 18, James, by the way, is the half-brother of Jesus. He said, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself 
if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Well, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You know, the, the title above verse 14 in your Bible probably says faith without works is dead. And I totally agree. We gotta talk the talk and walk the walk. Hebrews 13 Verse 16 says, do not neglect to do good and share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. It's a reminder that God is not just looking for our lip service. He's looking for life service. He's looking for devoted people who would display their godly works. By the way, not for, not for bragging rights. It's not to boast. It's not to be proud. We display our godly works to show the, our, our dark world the light of Christ. Jesus preached about this in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus said, You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a blanket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. It's so important that we use our words, and it's so important that we live out our faith. We need to do both if we're gonna be that billboard advertising for Christ. And by the way, this verse, so heavy, but it's good for all of us, including your pastor, to hear. Titus chapter one, verse 16. They profess to know God, right? So they have the works, but they deny him, or they have the words. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. Means they're living in sin. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Now you might, you might have a counter argument. You say, Jeremy, well, aren't we saved by grace, right? We're not saved by works. And I would say absolutely right. We are saved by grace. Remember Ephesians chapter two, Pastor Michael preached on this about six weeks ago. Verse eight of chapter two, for by grace you've been saved through faith and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. But verse 10 is absolutely true too. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, when you give your life to Christ, yes, you get a brand new life, you're heading to a brand new destination called heaven. You have a brand new father, but you also have a brand new mission. It's not just get saved and do whatever you want. Now it is saved and now you submit yourself to the master. One of the songs we just sang this morning, right? To our Lord, we say, Jesus, it is your life now, not mine. You, you have purchased me with your blood. Our works our works clearly matter to God. We just read a bunch of scripture defending that. But do you know that it's not just because people are watching, it's also because God is watching. In Romans chapter two, verse six, check out what Paul says God will do. Starting in verse six. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But those who are self-seeking, who do not obey the truth, right? These are non-Christians, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also to the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also to the Greek. All that to say, it really matters what we do with our life, with our bodies, with our works. Will your works shine for Christ? Will they be on display? Or will you keep them hidden underneath a blanket? Number three, last point. Does the world know by your love? So does the world know your love for him by your words, by your works, and also by your love? First Peter, or I'm sorry, First John chapter four, verse seven, says, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God's lo God abides in us 
and his love is per- perfected in us. And for the sake of time, go down to verse 19. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. Which, by the way, that's why the slogan is at our church. Loving God, loving people. It's that simple. We have to love others. It reminds me of an old Jars of Clay song, although I don't think they originally wrote it, but they remade the song. They will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Right? Isn't that so true? They will. What does this love look like? Well, that's our slogan, right? Loving God and loving people. First of all, it's very practical. It's very practical. First Peter chapter 4. The end of all things is at hand. Well, isn't that true, right? Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. You know, some people think, well, I can love God, but I don't have to love his people. I can love God, but I don't have to love church. I can love God. I, have to, I know I have to love God, but I'm not going to love the person next to me. I'm still mad at them. I would tell you, the Bible tells us we have to love everyone. And I would say to you, we get to love everyone. It turns out Jesus loves people that are hard to love. That's why he died for them. We can love too, even when it's hard. You know, love is a verb. It's an action word. First John chapter 3, verse 16, by this we know love, right? You're like, what does this love look like? Well, here's what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Love people enough to tell them the truth. That's using your words. And love people enough to serve them, good deeds to them. Does the world know your love for God by your benevolence, by your kindness, by your patience with them? Let us not act like the world and spew at one another when we get offended or raise up our fists. Let's instead love people even when it is hard. What does this all have to do with wisdom? And then I'll close. What does this have to do with wisdom? Well, while we've been in the Proverbs this month, it's so important that we understand that wisdom is not just here to protect us from foolishness. That is a part of it. God calls us to to walk in wisdom so that we wouldn't succumb to foolishness. But it also has this evangelistic effect where it is a comfort, it is a protection, but it is also a blessing to the world because our world has succumbed to foolishness. May the world know who Jesus is because of our words, our works, and our love. You know, the world knows a lot. We live in this info stage now. You can Google anything in a heartbeat and get the answer to that. But what it doesn't know and what it needs to know, the most important thing it needs to know is who is Jesus Christ? And is there a way out of my sin? Acts chapter 28, verse 30 says, he lived there. This is Paul. This is the end of Paul's life. He's, he's in Rome. He's about to die. He says, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Oh, would that be said about us two Christians? That we would proclaim with all boldness. Last verse for you, Joshua 1, 9. This is a verse that God says to Joshua, but I think it can apply to us in our setting too here in Tulare. Joshua, or God comforts Joshua by saying, have I not commanded you? Be strong, courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Being bold as a lion, it, yeah, it doesn't sound easy. It is difficult. But your boldness for, for Christ can change someone's life. So, so give it a try. Let me, let me pray. Thanks for watching our Tulare First Baptist YouTube channel. But don't stop here. Hit the subscribe button so you won't miss out on any of our future videos. Also, don't forget about the TFBC app where you can stay connected because we'd sure love to see you on a Sunday morning or at any of our events. May God bless you and have a great day.